Hello, this is uh, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Every Thursday at, at 1 p.m., 1 to 1.30 p.m., I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we have David Kirk West, who is an anarchist filmmaker from Southern Oregon, an activist, and, um, and just a cool guy. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you. David, uh, your recent um, short film, Occam's Razor, just uh, was released a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So would you, uh, could you explain that one a little bit? Um, for those of you who don't know, Occam's Razor is, uh, in a nutshell, it's the idea that the simplest solution is most likely correct. Um, uh, it, that's, that's boiling it down to a simple, a really simple level, but that's basically what it means. Uh, so, uh, I made a short film called Occam's Razor. It's sort of hard to classify. It's a, it's a little bit of an unusual film, but I would call it a darkly comedic paranoid thriller. It's, uh, um... Basically, it's about the dangers of being a hardcore conspiracy theorist. It's about a guy who is uh, really obsessed with conspiracy theories and thinks that everything's a conspiracy and starts to look into some stuff and uh, starts to believe that he's being followed. And the movie kind of evolves from there. It's about, uh, it's a little over 20 minutes long. I think with the credits and everything, it's 24 minutes. Um, uh, but yeah, I sort of made it in response specifically to the theories that uh, Sandy Hook was a hoax, because I was looking at some of them, and I was like, these are just asinine conspiracy theories. They're ridiculous. <laughs> and I wanted to make a response to that and try to try to make something that encourages people not to focus on like the minutia of these conspiracy theories mm -hmm. and to get so stuck on, oh, was this a false flag? Was this a conspiracy? When often there isn't a whole lot of evidence for it. Yeah. Um, but instead to worry about the important matters of liberty, you know, the things that really are happening, war, taxes, uh, you know, any sort of initiation of aggression, which all the government does, the police state, all that kind of stuff. Like, there's so many real issues that nobody denies are happening. Uh, I, I mean, like, for example, we've been talking about, as libertarians, about the militarization of the police for years, and now all of a sudden, like, that's a mainstream issue since Ferguson. Everyone's talking about that. If we focus on stuff like that, we have a way better chance of, um, of actually changing the culture. And if you really believe that everything's a conspiracy, too, well, then just join me in my fight to get rid of government, and you'll get rid of all those conspiracies, too. So, <laughs> exactly. <cool. laughs> yeah, yeah my, my thing with that is... Uh... Like, you're right, you know, there is more important um, issues to deal with, and when you do focus on those um, details, you, uh, you're you missing the big picture, and sometimes you may lose people because all you're really bickering about in the end is details, right? And Absolutely. And it's not really details that we're concerned with, it's like the big picture, which is, you know, um, it's murder whether you kill somebody here or you go overseas and do it and you have a costume on, right? <laughs> it's theft, exactly. right? It's theft if you're stealing from someone against their will regardless if you, if you have a costume on. So I think I think a great example uh, you know and a very timely one considering what day it is is 9/11. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, se September 11th. These people have all these wild theories about it being an inside job about there being, you know, controlled demolition. Uh, you know, just today I was watching a video people always claim, "Oh, oh, the two towers fell at free fall speeds." But just because someone said that doesn't mean it's true. The two towers Free fall speed for them would have been 9.22 seconds, I think, which is very easy to calculate mathematically. But if you watch like the videos, they actually fell in like 16 and 20 seconds for both the towers. Yeah. So it's just not true. Like people are just repeating these rumors <laughs> and stuff that they hear, yeah. and ironically, thinking they're being smart and you know thinking they're being clever and that they're um, you know just not taking everything the government says for granted. They take things that other people say for granted. And so everyone wants to make it about a false flag inside job, but even if it wasn't, and I don't think it was, it doesn't really matter because it wasn't right to go kill a bunch of completely unrelated Middle Easterners. Uh, you know, it wasn't right to start multiple wars. It wasn't right to erode civil liberties in the name of stopping another terrorist attack. And it wasn't right to, for America to have spent most of the 20th century uh, meddling in Middle Eastern affairs mm -hmm. and pissing off a bunch of people who became like extremists and then wanted to attack America because of it. Like it's, it's total blowback oh, yeah, and you, you don't even, basically you don't even need 
to think that the government, or that, yeah, that the government was behind 9-11 for 9-11 to be a huge black eye for the American government. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it was blowback, and it inspired a bunch of skullduggerous shit, so. I mean, I mean, even if, yeah, like you said, even if it was, <laughs> you know, um, 19, you know, Islamic fundamentalists that hijacked these planes and that, you know, you know and, uh, and destroyed everything they destroyed, um, Maybe that was as a result of all of the previous meddling that we did in the Middle East, <laughs> which is perfectly logical, right? You know, it's like you said, blowback. Um, mm-hmm. and, I've been and, debating that with people all day. And so the, the, and so the idea that as a result of, of that, those idiotic actions to go in, so, so basically so thir- around 3,000 people died in 9-11, right? And so our retaliation is to go in the Middle East, and I think uh, you know the last figure I, I I heard is about one million casualties in the Middle East. So so it's like and, you know I make the analogy like it's like a member of my family kills somebody, and so a suitable retaliation is to have me killed, my media family killed, my you know I just love my the distant block, family, right? you know the whole block, yeah. <laughs> So, like that's uh, you know anybody ever seeing that person you know it just doesn't make sense and of course you know with all of that you know talking about the drone strikes with all of that you're gonna of course have uh, the uh, the creation of new terrorists and and people who just hate America you know so the ongoing the ongoing wars in the Middle East and now Obama is announcing more military action um, yep you know, like it's it's just breeding <laughs> hatred for America it's breeding enemies so like why do we even need to focus on nine eleven like even it, really, what's it ever going to do? The people who would punish the people who did it work for them. So I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do? It convince get Dick Cheney and George Bush arrested, even if even if they were behind. Yeah. And, and, and he, like as if that's the only like criminal thing they ever did. Like, yeah. No, it's not. We just need to get rid of government. Stop yeah, yeah. Worrying about all this other stuff. Yeah. So so um, you know about Occam's Razor. I, I uh, my um, reaction to it was. Uh, you know, it's very thought-provoking, philosophic, and uh, you know, it just, it just, yeah, made you think how easily people jump to conclusions um, when you're when you're faced with um, benign circumstances. That really, you know, sometimes things just have no meaning. Sometimes things just happen. You know, <laughs> and why can't that ever happen, right? <laughs> I mean. Uh, yeah, and, and like you said before, some people got insulted with that, right? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I had a couple. I had a couple like YouTube rants where there were people like, um, "Oh, I, how how are you trying to keep people asleep with a stupid movie like this? You're terrible. You should have tried this five years ago. Maybe you would have kept us asleep." And I'm just like, "What do you think I am? Like a government plant?" I mean, sure enough, I've gotten comments like telling me, "Oh, you must be a a government plant." And I've ran into people. Wow, really. Who, who think I'm some sort of like yeah like my film's like a psyop and they're like oh the go- how much the government pay to make that movie I'm like well, actually I made it for a couple hundred bucks out of my own wallet and I, I would love to see a paycheck like I'm, I'm waiting on I haven't seen it yet so oh, oh really wow oh, so, so what about the actors did, did they uh, they do it pro bono or mm-hmm. oh wow it's, oh I guess because a lot of them were your friends. Yeah, I mean, basically, every yeah, pretty much it, all my all my films. If you watch them, everyone in them is my friends. I mean, yeah. the, the most I ever really have paid so far to date uh, is you know transportation and stuff. The main actor in Occam's Razor was a uh, he was one of my best friends' roommate in college. He was a stage actor. He's really good. And we've since been introduced through our mutual friend and become uh, pretty good friends. Yeah. And um, I wanted to use him in something. He'd helped me out in a really minor thing in the past. And so I wanted to give him a big role in something. So when I came up with Occam's Razor, I was like, yeah. oh, he'd be perfect as this, like, just deranged, kind of uh, twitchy, paranoid character. <laughs> uh, he lives in Seattle, though, so I actually flew him down here. I managed to wow. talk my mom into giving me some of her frequent flyer miles so that I could fly him down for almost nothing. Nice. And, I, 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 as well, I wanted to ask you next is about your family. You know, what does your family think about you know, volunteerism, anarchy, and, and, and your films that you make? <laughs> well, they definitely support my filmmaking. Um, uh, <laughs> I've gotten a lot of my immediate family, they're all pretty much, they're all pretty libertarian. I still argue with them a lot about a lot of stuff, especially my mom. Uh, She's still more conservative than yeah. they are. I, I have three younger brothers, and uh, they're all pretty solidly libertarian i don't quite know about anarchists but they're almost there at least so that's good and even my mom is 
a lot more down the libertarian line than a lot of people. Okay. But uh, yeah, I've, I've been working on my family yeah. <laughs> for years now. Yeah, and 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 so you said um, before that you you're also a veteran, right? You uh, mm -hmm. you were in the army. So yeah. uh, so how was your experience over there? How, how would you uh, describe it? Well. Well, after I got back from Iraq, I applied for discharge as a conscientious objector. So that should tell you something. Yeah. Um, basically, like in a nutshell, my experience over there was was I joined the army in uh, like June two thousand eight, right after I graduated high school. I'd already actually been enlisted for a couple months through the delayed entry program. So I shipped out like two weeks after I graduated high school, thinking, you know, well, my whole life growing up, people telling me the military or they're heroes and they're like the best young men in the country and they're fighting for our freedom. Yeah. Uh, it's such a noble thing to do. So here I am thinking I was going to go do something good for America and go protect people. And, uh, you know, at first I really enjoyed it. I was like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. You know, I'm liking my training and stuff. And uh, by the time I got to my unit, I was starting to be a little bit more like, uh, the people around me are kind of a bunch of sociopaths or just idiots. Um, I don't know how I feel about this. But I'm like, no, no, no don't think like that. You'll, once you get over to Iraq, you'll see how important this is. And I went over to Iraq, and uh, if you watch my short film, One Man's Terrorist, you'll sort of learn my thought process on Iraq. But mm -hmm. basically... Uh, you know, at first I'm kind of thinking like, oh yeah, it's cool to be over here, I'm making a difference. But as time wore on, I'm just kind of realizing, you know what, with the stuff we're doing to these people, if I was an Iraqi, I'd be shooting back too. I mean, I have, I own so many guns, like this is just the gun that's sitting next to me. Here's my house gun that I carry in my, in my desk. Um, yeah, I have, I have tons of guns. I guess I only have the two in here right now. Yeah got about 40 in the room over here. Oh my God. So I'm to myself like, I own a lot of guns. Yeah. I know how to shoot. Uh, I'm an aggressive kind of guy. Yeah. If my country was invaded, I'd shoot back. Like, I'd be the first guy shooting back. Yeah. Yeah. Can I really blame these people for shooting back? Especially when we're kicking in their doors and confiscating their guns and wow. treating them with shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just kind of realized, I started to feel like I was working for the bad guys. So, uh, and eventually I just fully realized I was working for the bad guys. And that was what that was what basically turned me into an anarchist. I was already pretty much, I was already very libertarian leaning. I was kind of at this point where, like, I I supported Ron Paul in the two thousand eight election, um, but I didn't I didn't agree with him on foreign policy. I was like, oh well, I don't know. Like, it's good what we're doing over there. We need to fight the terrorists, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, It was that simple. Um, so, uh, I, I basically when I was in the army, um. I thought like the only necessary function of government was national defense. So I was pretty much like mm, courts, a police force that fights back against you know real crimes, not victimless crimes, and a military. That's about the only function of a government. And uh, you know, once I realized like, wait, what we're doing overseas is not necessary or justified. Do I really believe that national defense? is like a, you know, because I, I believe that government was a necessary evil. I didn't think government was like this great, grand institution. I was like, government is a necessary evil that we need to defend the country. Mm -hmm. And once that idea started breaking down in my mind, I was like, well, shit, if I don't believe that, if I don't believe that national defense is necessary for the government to do, then that's the only thing I actually believe was the government's the only legitimate function. I don't believe that government is even a necessary evil, it's just evil, so am I an anarchist? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And I just kind of started realizing, I was like, oh shit, I'm an anarchist. <laughs> what the hell, I always thought anarchists were like, was like a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so over the course of a couple months, I sort of came to the idea of voluntarism. I actually like, like literally thought up that word without having ever even had anyone tell it to me. I hadn't, I, I didn't have any resources. It was just me in my barracks waiting to get out of the army thinking like, well, you know, <laughs> I believe, if I believe that government isn't necessary evil, that means that taxation is just theft, not some necessary evil. I believe we own ourselves. And I came to all these really libertarian conclusions. And then while I was, um, I wrote my, I applied for discharge as a conscientious objector. I had to like write paper after paper explaining my positions and proving to them that, I yes, I really believe this. I'm not just trying to get out of the Army because I don't want to be in it. And uh, 
Uh, at one point, it was getting approved, 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 and then the post command, you know, it was approved by the guy investigating me, it was approved by my commander, approved by the battalion commander, then it goes up to, like, the post commander, you know, some two-star general who's never seen me in his life, <laughs> goes up to his desk, and it sits there for months and months and months and months, and finally, I got sick of waiting for it, so I wrote to my congressman, mistake, he's a Republican, <laughs> and said, can you help me? A week later... Uh, like less than a week later, like five or six days later after he, or, no, I think it was within about two weeks. So it was right, right in the right amount of time. I don't know if this is what happened, but it happened in this time frame where to me it looked like my congressman got my letter, couldn't believe that a soldier in his district would have the gall to apply for discharge as a conscientious objector because he's a total warmonger and hater. Yeah. Uh, Greg Walden, Oregon 2nd Congressional District, if any of you are wondering. <laughs> and uh, probably called up the post and told the general he should disapprove it. Because it was really suspicious that, like, the minute I wrote to my congressman, all of a sudden I got disapproved. And so then I had to write an appeal saying, yes, because uh, then his recommendation goes to, like, the board in Washington, D.C. or wherever, Virginia somewhere, that, like, does the final approval. So I had to write a... Uh, I had to write a letter explaining, like, re-explaining and rebutting what he said. Because what he said was like, oh, well, he's not really opposed to war. He just doesn't like the government. And I was like, yeah, well, that means I'm opposed to all government work. It means I can't believe in working for the government yeah. as a soldier. So as I was writing a um, my rebuttal paper, I got online and decided I'm going to try to find some historical precedents for how I'm getting out. And I ended up finding an example of a guy uh, who had basically my same views, who called himself an individualist anarchist who got discharged as a conscientious objector in the mid-90s. And so I had kind of some historical precedents on my side. While I was on the Internet looking for that kind of stuff, I stumbled across a website that had a really good article about conscientious objection. And I was like, wow, this is really good. But I was always really leery of any article like that because I always assumed... It probably comes from some like left-wing anti-war site, and it's like, you know, I agree with you on the war issue, but you probably are a hypocrite who wants to take my guns and, you know, <laughs> tax the shit out of me in other ways. Yeah. So I was really cautious as I approached this website, but I started reading more and more articles and being like, no, I agree with like everything these people are saying. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, this guy called himself a voluntarist. That's like the same word I came up with. <laughs> and I started realizing like these people who are writing on this website had come to every single conclusion that I had through logic and the consistent application of, you know, like the non-aggression principle and stuff. And I was like, wow, I'm not just crazy. Like, I really, I was right. I really did just come to the logical conclusion of my libertarian beliefs. And uh, that website was lourockwell.com. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> ever <laughs> since then, I've been like a near daily reader. And uh, I realized before too long, like, no, this is a legit website. It's not just some liberal website. It has a few articles about anti-war stuff. Yeah. That I agree. So that was kind of how I became an anarchist. And basically, I applied for discharge as a conscientious objector in November. Already around like September, while I was still mulling over whether or not I should do this, I was starting to be like, am I an anarchist? Mm -hmm. And uh, by January, I'd started calling myself an anarchist and had discovered you know, all this other anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist literature out there. And so, uh, so, so basically, that's my journey to anarchism. So, so, you, so you came to the conclusion before you read the literature, basically, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I realized I was an anarchist before I read anything. That's cool. And it, just, <laughs> it just gave me this sense of vindication and confirmation that, yes, I was right. Because yeah. I'm sitting there, I'm like, like man, I feel like, like, I feel like there's no one else out there who thinks what I think. I, am I crazy? Because I don't feel crazy. I feel like I'm just being really logical. You know, I've always believed that, like, you own yourself. And so I'm like, Man, if you own yourself, like, how can people tell you, you know, how can people take your money? How can people tell you not to put this substance in your body, not to own that gun? I had all these ideas. I'm like, this seems really logical to me to think that taxation is theft. I mean, how is it not? Yeah. I'm like, maybe I'm just crazy. Like, I'll, you know, I'll just take it for granted that. I'll take the government's word that it's like a necessary evil. And then finally I was like, oh, no, fuck this. It's not necessary evil. It's, <laughs> it's obviously theft. Yeah. I, I, and, and, and once I saw other people had came to not just like similar conclusions, because like throughout my life I'd run into people that I agreed with on a lot of issues, but then we disagree on other issues. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of just felt like, oh, we just had our opinions and that was that. No, I started running into people who agreed with me exactly, like to the minutia of every issue, mm -hmm. um, to a T. And that gave me this really strong sense of vindication. Like, yeah, if we all came to not just similar conclusions, 
but basically the exact same conclusion, we have to be onto something. Like we really are just being logical and consistent. Yeah. So, so was there any any other uh, of your uh, peers in the army that came to the same the same conclusion that you that you keep in touch with? Uh, I don't really keep in touch too much with anyone from those days. Every now and then I'll talk to like one or two guys. I mean, yeah. like, like once a year or something. Yeah. There wasn't anyone that came to like the exact same conclusions, but after I came out and said yes, I'm a conscient. I want to get out as a conscientious objector. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a lot of guys like, "Oh, you're an idiot" and stuff. But it, there was also a lot of guys who came out of the woodwork. I mean, we're talking like like dozens of guys who come up like, "Hey, I agree with you." You know, yeah. there are guys who ended up just writing out their four year contract and not re enlisting. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, I'm sure a lot of these guys then go on to, they don't want to admit that they wasted four years of their life serving a tyrannical government. Yeah. They don't tell their family, no, don't call me a hero. Yeah. So they just kind of go along with it. But there were a lot more guys than I had expected. Like, I talked with one or two guys that were kind of sympathetic beforehand. Mm -hmm. But after that, uh, and it was funny because my chain of command... You could tell they were a little irritated about it, that there were privates that would listen to me. That was like, don't listen to West. He's crazy. And <laughs> then guys would come up to me in private, and they'd be like, you know what? They say you're crazy, but it makes a lot of sense. Like, you're not crazy. Uh -huh. you're, not, you're not an idiot, you know? <laughs> like, it, it was kind of easy to blow me off, because while I was waiting to get out, I was just sort of relegated to being with all the other people who were getting kicked out of the army, like, for pissing hot for math or, you know, for, for having a bunch of DUIs or whatever. So it was okay. easy to kind of discredit me as, like, a crazy troublemaker with those guys. <laughs> then people would talk to me, and I was like, they're like, oh, that actually makes a lot of sense, like what you're saying. <laughs> I kind of felt the same way while I was in Iraq. So yeah. it was good. I mean, I think I at least planted a seed in a lot of guys. Cool, minds. yes. I mean, you, I, I, yeah, I mean, it's funny that, that, that we're in the same camp as, uh, you know, genuinely insane people, but... The fact is, when you have an insane society, you know it's the uh, it's the same people that seem insane, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, yeah, oh, totally. <laughs> so uh, you know, because we're in the minority, so you know, we have to contend with all the uh, you know the lunacy that's going on around us that's uh, taken for normal. <laughs> you know, um, you know all the uh, nine hundred what it was it like nine hundred plus military uh, bases across the world. Yeah, it's like 900, it's 900 something, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's like, uh, how much more before the, you know, the United States collapses, you know, it's like, how much, how, how much more can we spread ourselves thin, you know, it's just, it's just like so reminiscent to me of the Roman Empire right before it collapsed, I, right? I tell people all the time, like, there's 900 bases in, like, 140-ish countries, I think it is, I could be quite, I haven't looked at those stats in a while, yeah. like, how is that not an empire, like, what that... <laughs> No, no, it's not. It's not the same as the British Empire or the Roman Empire. We're doing it for good reasons. I'm like, <laughs> for good reasons. What, was, what was the British Empire doing it for? Because they were cartoonishly evil. No, they thought they were spreading, you know, freedom and democracy around the world. They thought they were civilizing it yeah. by being a bunch of imperialists. <laughs> no one just goes out and says, "Oh, we just want to take over the world because we're evil and want to kill everybody." Exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that uh, reminds me of, uh, you know, Larkin Rose mentioned that also. How you know. Tyrants, when tyrants come to power, they don't, they don't, they don't, their um, rhetoric is not, you know, I want to, you know, rob all you people and use that money to, you know, kill millions of people, <laughs> you know? It's like Hitler, Hitler did not, you know, start World War II and perpetrate the Holocaust <laughs> by saying, oh, look at these stupid Jews. They're a bunch of assholes. Let's kill them all. Yeah. He, like, sold people this line of fiction, like, oh, the Jews are, you know, they're, they're like, they're like the one percent that ruled the country, you know, politically, and, uh -huh. and made it made like this kind of populist hatred for them. And you know, people thought, oh yeah, Germany's been so, you know, downtrodden by the rest of the world since World War One. Like that. I mean, it was fucked up. It was bullshit. But I mean, there were actual motivations there. Yeah. I think, and that's that's actually kind of one of the issues I have to tie this back into my film Occam's Razor. That's one of the issues I have with conspiracy theorists. I've had people, you know, like just the other day, I was at uh, I was at a party in Southern California with Adam Kokesh and a bunch of other libertarian activists, and there were some people there who were like, when I showed them my film and was debating conspiracy theories with them, they were like, well, "Why are you? Who's paying you to be here? Are you like a government plant?" Which is ridiculous. Yeah. And um, you know, they started uh, like saying, "Well, are you even? Are you, what, how, how are you even a libertarian? How are you even an anarchist?" I'm like, "Well, honestly." I feel like I'm kind of a purer anarchist than you are because I don't need to think that the state is some cartoon villain. You know, I don't need to think that the state's like 
fucking Cobra Commander or some James Bond villain always plotting to take over the world and murder everybody uh -huh. to think that they're evil. Yeah. I think that they're evil even in their most mundane form, just going door to door, you know, <laughs> taking down census statistics for tax purposes in the future, whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, and so it's like, like these conspiracy theorists, it's almost like they want to make the government into a cartoon villain who just always wants to kill people and depopulate the globe and poison everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, like, um, I, you know, you know, you know, talking about like the most mu mundane. Are you still there? You still there? Oh, not bad. Oh, connection. Yeah, I don't okay. get you. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. You're going in and out. Okay. <laughs> All right, so yeah, so so talking about you know the most mundane aspects of government, um, you know, like I uh, I like to teach chess, right? And so I go to mm -hmm. I go to libraries often, right? And I and also actually you know because I take care of my kids, I go to parks often, right? And so my family <laughs> they, they like to tell me, what kind of an anarchist are you? Right. You're going to parks, you're going to libraries, <laughs> you know? What do you think it pays for those? <laughs> I'm like. Well, what's my alternatives? You know, it's like if if there's privately right, funded right. parks, you know, I would love to go to those or, or privately funded library. You know, so I mean, we do go to Barnes and Nobles. You know, that's nice. Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, or Wikipedia, but but um, but yeah. So so libraries. You know, so so some people who um, who you know who advocate for government. You know, they say, well, you know, look, we have libraries, we have roads, we have all these nice things. You know, how could you be so against you know libraries and roads and things like that? Well, the idea is that is that you know what you do with the stolen funds does not cancel out the initial immorality of the, of the theft, right? <laughs> what here, like what I always say, because you know, the, the, like like I was saying, these conspiracy theorists, it's almost comes off a lot of the time. And I'm not saying there's not conspiracy theorists who, are, who aren't legitimate anarchists; they're definitely out there. But I feel like a lot of the times. Their opposition to government is more because they think the government is doing all this heinously evil conspiratorial nonsense than it is that government is just an immoral, violent enterprise to begin with. I think that the truly diabolical evil of government is not their ability to, you know, to orchestrate vast conspiracies. I think the government's too incompetent to really orchestrate vast conspiracies most of the time. <laughs> the truly diabolical evil of government is its ability to spread the blame so thin that no one feels responsible for the heinous stuff that it does. Look at taxation. It is outright theft, and there is no logical argument that it isn't. But because, you know, one guy writes the tax laws, or hundreds of guys write the tax laws... A bunch of other people interpret them. A bunch of other people enforce them. The police arrest you if you, you know, don't follow them. Oh, yeah. There's so many people who are culpable for, for like one act of theft. Yeah. No one really feels like a thief. Or war, for example. Like, you know, people can be in the military and they can. I met so many guys who thought the war was fucked up, but they're like, oh, but I'm still just serving my country, just doing my job. I'm like, I'm just doing my job. There's <laughs> such a disconnect there. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the guy who. I thought I was going to be doing something good, and as soon as I realized that I wasn't, I was like, fuck this, I'm out of here. I don't yeah. believe in this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, so like, like, how do you stay in? And it's just because they think, well, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just a truck driver. You know, those are the guys that shoot them. Well, you know, you're the guy that drove them to the mission where they killed these innocent people. Yeah. So are you really any less to blame? And people just... There's so many people involved in government, you can always pass the blame somewhere else and think that you're doing good. And that is the truly tragic, diabolical evil of government because it allows legitimately good people, decent people, to be used for evil and to be deceived into thinking they're doing something good. You know, and, and the scariest thing is to me is that how, um, you know, government, since government is always expanding, always expanding, um, you know, there must come a point where the industrious, the private sector, can no longer fund them through their, you know, productivity. And so, as a result, it must collapse, right? Um, and, and that's the scary part to me because as it grows, people are inhabiting it and working for it, believing that <clears throat> that's a real job. 
they think like you know working in a school I'm just a teacher you know or working for the IRS you know I'm I just work for the IRS they think that's a real job that actually makes um, you know adds value to society whereas since it's funded by taxation its very existence is um, impoverishing us impoverishing all of us all of us you know all the time <laughs> and and it's scary how people t they they confuse private sector jobs and public sector jobs and they just meld them together and they think it's the same so to me that's scary that that you know when is the when is the point when the when the industries can no longer support that <laughs> expansion you know when does that happen and and then once that you know once we reach that point you know watch out <laughs> <laughs> I hope we hit it soon. I would love to get to that point. You know, because because to me, there's nothing really that's going to check the expansion of government. You know, N no, you know, Ron Paul was a great. Um, he was a great pilot. Maybe uh, you know he tried, but you know, it, you know, the government is a leviathan right now. It's uh, oh yeah. At the at the end of the day, Ron Paul was never going to make a difference in the government. The difference he made was as like a figurehead for the yeah. liberty movement, as a as a spokesperson and yeah. waking people up and getting people to start thinking yeah you know that that was a far like you know he holds the record for the most single no votes in congress like <laughs> yeah. was it was it really ever going to make a difference if he's the only guy who doesn't constantly vote for spending bills there wasn't yeah, but yeah, it yeah. does get other people to think so that's where his true value lies is not in his function as a government agent as a government employee yeah. Boy, but and it's, yeah, you know, and what he's doing is basically a private person. Yeah, yeah. Basically, um, I, I whenever I hear of a politician attempting to do good in government, I, I think of the quote: um, um, "Sending a good man to reform the state is like sending a virgin to reform a whorehouse." <laughs> <laughs> you know, Pretty much. It's like it's like, and, and also Stefan Monu says similar things. Like, if you really think that you can go into something as massive. And uh, complex as government, and change it. It you know why don't you start with something smaller? Start with the KKK. Start yeah. you know, try to make the KKK a Black Brotherhood, right? <laughs> yeah, and, oh, exactly. And if you can do that, then maybe you have a shot <laughs> with government. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but but you know we're we're um, just about um, at the half hour mark. So I just want to um, finish up and also uh, let people know where they can uh, find your work. Absolutely. Um, yeah, if you want to check out my work, uh, the easiest way would be my Facebook page, facebook.com slash buck the system. Buck the system is the name of my uh, production company. As you can see right here, I'm wearing my, uh, my buck the system t-shirt. <laughs> nice. I also have my website, buckthesystem.tv. Nice. Uh, uh, but yeah, go there and uh, all my short films are available on YouTube. I'm not one of these filmmakers who just withholds them and wants to only enter them and let them be seen at uh, you know, film festivals. I want to be seen by the world. So, um, you know, I've been uh, trying to get my stuff as out there as out there as possible. So, if you yeah. want to watch it, share it by all means, please yeah, do. Yeah, that's the that's the thing I was I was thinking about with filmmakers is that you know if um, you know I guess you know most filmmakers want to get compensated and the, and the easiest way is to withhold it until people you know buy it or rent it, right? And so, well, the truth is, you're not ever going to get compensated for a short film unless perhaps it um, attains some sort of viral success okay. and you make some money off of ad revenue. Yeah. Other, other than that, I mean, you're not going to make anything off of short films. You might get it seen by the right people and find future opportunities. Yeah. But the short film itself, I always hear people like, "Oh, well, but I can't release it online. Then I can't get distribution." I'm like, "Who the hell cares? What are you gonna make?" I, I've read accounts from filmmakers who get distribution and get their films picked up by the most prestigious short film distribution companies and shown on, you know, the independent film channel or whatever. And you know how much like this guy made in this account I was reading? Like six hundred dollars. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, it's it's, it's nothing. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah. Pocket change, you know. Like, granted, if one of my films made six hundred dollars in YouTube revenue, sweet, you yeah, know. Yeah. That means it's been seen by hundreds of thousands of people, and I'm getting, a, you know, some money to pay for my cell phone bill and gas and car insurance <laughs> for the next couple months. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's not. It's not like it's not enough money to really encourage you to withhold it. Feature films are a different story, you know. I understand if you make a feature film. 
you know, you don't want to release it because that's something you can realistically get distribution for if it's well made. You know, I'm planning on making a feature film next year, and I'm not going to be releasing it just free online. You know, I want it to be seen by as many people as possible, but I want to start making a serious living, and I'm probably going to invest a couple ten thousand dollars into the film. Wow. So at some point, you do need to see a return. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's that's nothing. I'm going to get on Kickstarter and try to raise twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Uh, nice. That's nice. incredibly low budget. It's almost nothing for what I want to do. But yeah, I was just going to I was just going to say that those kind of websites. Uh, they sound like they've made um, you know a lot of projects possible that you know are, are difficult to to fund otherwise, right? Well, absolutely. Um, and I have a, you know, I've been the last couple of years building up a little bit of a following on Facebook and YouTube and stuff. So hopefully, hopefully that'll translate into donations. But we'll see. Awesome, excellent. So, um, all right. So that's um, this is book the system. David Kirk West, uh, filmmaker, anarchist, and activist. So this is um, peaceful anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Wishing everyone have a wonderful night. Take care.